Hi, this is Daniel Catala, reaching out to you from San Francisco, California. I'm very excited today to share with you my approach to composting. Over these last five years, I've developed a method that is cheap, simple, odorless, attractive, and yields abundant compost, like what you see in the bucket here in front of me. This is some of the best compost that you can generate using your garden trimmings and your, your organic waste that you generate in your kitchen. It's a uh, chuck full of worms. You can see them right here. Uh, and uses I have for this compost is to fertilize uh, kitchen herbs, the fruit trees in, in my house, and uh, also to share with friends that need it. So I'm gonna take care of planting out this basil, and then I'll meet you downstairs We'll talk a little bit more about the theory of composting. Before I get into the theory of composting, I wanted to let you know that the method I use requires you to have a small backyard that you can dig up. It doesn't have to be a large space, maybe a pathway, but the method employs the burial of compost underground. So I want to let you know this before we get into it. With regards to the critical elements that make up compost, I created a, a mnemonic to help you remember. It's the earth cannot wait, okay? The E stands for earth, and it has to do with all the things that are in the soil. Things that are alive, like earthworms, insects, bacteria, fungus, and things that are not alive, like the mineral portion, clay, sand, silt. Whatever soil you have, use what you have. Don't go get soil from elsewhere. The C stands for carbon, and this refers to organic waste that is rich in carbon. Some examples are paper. This can be your spam mail, your bills. I love recycling bills. Uh, envelopes, or if you wipe down your counter with paper towels, egg crates, all those are good sources of carbon as are your garden trimmings, like when you trim your bushes. The other component is nitrogen. And you can think of these as all the green things that are squishy, like the pulp of fruits, leftover rice, meat. Uh, in this bowl, I have some examples of the things that I'm composting. We have a banana peel, we have citrus peel, we have eggshells. All of these are things that are considered to be nitrogen rich. The next element is water. For things to break down, they need moisture. And finally, a, a great accelerant for decomposition is oxygen. If you combine all of these elements together, you will get great compost. And my goal for the next section is to show you how to harvest and how to make all of these elements present in your compost. The first thing that your compost is going to need is nitrogen-rich organic materials. You can get these from the kitchen, as shown by the contents of this bin, and also from the garden. So let's take a deep plunge into the bin, do some forensics, and see what are things that you could collect that are rich in nitrogen. I'm just going to start pulling things out of the bin, and as I take them out, let you know what they are. A rule of thumb is if it came from an animal or came from a plant, it's okay to put it in here. Okay, off the bat, we have some stems from parsley and from basil. We have peels, in this case it's uh, from carrot and also from uh, onion. We have a, uh, a coffee grind uh, with uh, some uh, a kitchen towel and a banana peel. We have some uh, uh, mango peel. Uh, there's a, a cork. I have some uh, correspondence letters uh, the leftover of a corn on the cob. Let's see if there's anything else good in here. I'm going to just start uh, spilling it over. There's the core of a pear, um, the, the butt end of uh, celery. We also have some uh, old uh, meat products. So all of these things are fine. You can put any dairy, any meats, spicy food, old food, if you made a recipe and you didn't like it, put it in here. If you burn something, put it in here. 
If you go to a restaurant and get a doggy bag, it's okay to put it in here. The method of composting that I use can accept anything that comes from an animal or from a plant. Uh, this bin is essential to how I compost, so I want to give you more details on why I use such a large bin and what the advantages are. Most household compost bins for sale look like the ones shown here. They're small in size and are to be kept at room temperature on your countertop. This means that you will have to frequently empty the container and if you're not careful it may start smelling or attracting bugs. That is why I opted for a much larger container that I empty on a weekly basis. Also because it is kept in the freezer it is out of sight, it never smells nor does it attract pests. An additional benefit is that the freezing and later thawing of the food scraps makes mush out of them and this accelerates their breakdown. One drawback is that you will have less storage room in the freezer for your frozen food. Let me show you how I set up this bin when I'm going to do some serious cooking. In the kitchen I have a garbage bin that has the ideal height to rest the bin on top of it. The chopping board is off to the side and slightly higher. So as I peel, chop and dice, it's easy enough to use the blade of the knife to just scrape things into the bin or to throw things in there directly with my hands. Here I'm preparing breakfast, blood orange and bananas, and in a moment I'll show you a, a dinner preparation. The speed of the video has been accelerated here two to three times faster. I wish I could work this fast. <clears throat> so here are the carrots being peeled and we will scrape those peels into the bin at which point I'm ready for cleanup and I'll just grab a paper towel wipe everything down and throw in the paper towel too at the end of the cleaning session uh, once I'm done with cooking I put the bin back in the freezer and that's the end of this section in the kitchen now let's look at the garden and see what that has to offer the kitchen area generates a lot of nitrogen rich materials but so does the garden so let's take a walk around and see what's available to begin with a hedge any hedge will give you great nitrogen rich clippings another source is dead or diseased leaves that you pull off your plant Here's a leaf that uh, doesn't look too healthy. I'm just going to cut it off and put it into our bin. You can also make use of plants that have overgrown and are interfering with your pathway, for example. These plants have overgrown. Now I'm removing suckers from the base of a rose plant. When you prune back a tree, like I'm doing with this lemon plant, this is another place where you can find nitrogen rich material. Be sure to cut it down into smaller pieces to accelerate the breakdown. Whatever weeds you have in your garden, collect those too and be sure to add it to your compost. It doesn't matter if the seed head is on the weed or not. They're good to go, it's a legitimate source of nitrogen and it will work just fine. The last item I have on my list is uh, flowers. Whenever a flower has reached its end point, take it off, add it to your compost. We've spent five minutes in the garden and look what a large bin of nitrogen rich organic material we have put together. To make one thing clear, I do not store this in the freezer. I store this in the garden 
the only thing I store in the freezer are food scraps. The other important components of compost is carbon rich materials. So I want to review those with you next so that you have a better idea of what they look like and what you can collect. Now that we've viewed how to collect nitrogen-rich waste products, I'd like to shift into carbon-rich products. I have an assortment here on the table of things that you will uh, have from your kitchen when you clean up, when you receive packages, or when you purchase things. All of these items can go into your compost with the exception of some of them. So if you wipe your counter and you have some Windex or soap in it, it doesn't matter. Just grab that, put it into your bin. Uh, if you receive newspapers, a lot of the dyes being used now are safe. They're based on the soy plant inks. This can go in there also. Uh, for paper products, it's good to shred them up and put them in there. Uh, some people do not compost white paper because it's bleached. Uh, I don't have a problem with that because it will sit in the ground for about four months transforming those products. And if I get an envelope like this that has a piece of plastic, I just remove the, the plastic portion over here and put in the rest. Uh, if you have paper bags when you're shopping, for cardboard boxes, you do want to remove the cellophane wrap. This will not break down. And uh, with a, paper, a box cutter, you can cut it into pieces. If I have a lot of cardboard, I don't put it in the bin that goes in the freezer. I store it in the garden area. Uh, now, a word about things that should not go in the into the bin. Uh, if you have materials that have color and are shiny, like this, or these type of packages, do not compost them because they use heavy metals in the colors and to get this glossy effect. So none of these packages would I compost right over here. Let's go down to the garden and I'll show you some carbon-rich material from the yard that you can also compost. Your garden will offer a lot of carbon-rich materials that you can use for compost. Let me show you down here. Uh, first of all is dry leaves. These are pine needles. We have eucalyptus leaves. This may acidify your soil. This has some growth inhibitors, but it doesn't matter. Over the course of four or five months, it will all become nice compost. So go ahead and store this in a bin. The other things you may have is uh, leaves um, that will fall off your plants. And uh, if you have longer branches, I do recommend you cut them up so that it's easy to put them inside the hole where we bury the compost. These are all examples of carbon-rich garden materials that are mainly woody in nature. When I have water laying around the house, I like to add it to my bin. The reason I do that is because all that organic matter is going to go into the ground. I want it to stay moist so that the earthworms will be attracted, they'll move in and help to transform all of it into good soil. So for example here I have a vase with flowers and it's time for them to go. So I'll just grab my trusty bin and of course we're going to compost the flowers but I would also take the water and pour that in. Let me show you in the kitchen other places where you can casually find water and keep adding it to your bin. When a pan is caked with a lot of crud, I will soak it overnight to soften the sides and then scrub it in the morning. So once that's done, this water, upsy daisy, can go into the bin. Leftover coffee, milk, Juice, tea, water, they all go in. If you're soaking beans or thawing something like I'm doing here, add that water. After we bury the compost, the water will be used by thousands of different soil organisms to digest the food. These organisms include bacteria, fungi, insects, and earthworms. In the next section, I will tell you more about soil and the life within it. One of the things that makes this type of composting in the ground successful is collaborating with earthworms. And I'd like to explain to you the difference between wild worms 
garden variety worms, and uh, another species called red wigglers. So let me take out here a worm that you could find in your backyard if you dug up a little bit. Let me see if I can lift this up here. Come here, buddy. What you'll notice is that these worms are relatively large. They tend to be brown in color or gray, slightly reddish. These worms, if this is the soil, go up and down the soil profile, vertically, down into the soil, then back up, depending on the time of day. This other worm, the red wiggler, is thinner, uh, darker red in color, and if you look at the soil profile, they live close to the surface, and they move horizontally, back and forth. These worms are much more voracious. They are better decomposers. They can eat their own body weight several times over in the course of a day. So, buy these online or go to your local garden store, ask for red wigglers, and when you bury your compost, bury these along with your food. If you keep your garden fed with compost, with food scraps, and wet, they will stick around. I want you to be successful at composting. In order for this to happen, you need to follow a rule of thumb that I call the triple S rule. When it comes to your composting, people don't want to see it, they don't want to smell it, and they don't want to step in it. Especially in an urban, densely populated environment where you have roommates, family members, and neighbors, if you can stick to these three rules, you'll do well with composting. The method of composting that I recommend is called trench composting, and it entails burying the compost on the ground. This is a great method for beginners because the soil represents a natural barrier that keeps away uh, rodents and other pests and it also follows those three rules that I just showed you. You will need uh, a yard that you can dig up and have a minimum of 10 different holes scattered around the garden. This allows you to bury the compost in the first hole then move on to the second hole and keep going all the way around the garden, by the time you get back to the first hole, the organic matter will have decomposed. When you dig up your garden, be cautious the first time. Use hand tools and dig in slowly because there's gas lines, electrical lines, irrigation lines. Once you've established that a whole area is safe, you can go at it with a spade and full steam ahead. But the first time around, proceed with caution. Next, what I'll do is show you, with the aid of this plastic bag, the layering that takes place within the hole that you dig. What are the different layers and in what order you should add organic matter to your hole. Imagine this area is your garden, and this bag is the hole that you just dug up. This is how you layer the organic matter. You're going to start with your kitchen scraps because these have sugars and oils and all sorts of things that will attract pests. I also include uh, meat products and the organic waste that I recycle into compost. Once you've added the kitchen scraps, the next layer that's going to go in is yard trimmings. That is leaves, stems, spent flowers, weeds. In this layer, you can also include cardboard. If you receive deliveries, you just shred that cardboard up roughly with your hands and add it to this second layer. Finally, the third layer is going to be soil. When you dig the hole out, you're going to have a mound of soil right beside the hole. Use that to cap the hole. This will be the third layer. Once you've added soil, you're going to finish it off with wood chips. <clears throat> The reason for the wood chips at the very end is it, it, it provides a, a finishing mantle that is very nice to look at. And here it is, this is what your buried material will look like. Food scraps at the very bottom, yard trimmings second layer, soil above that, and finally the wood chips on top. This was a lot of fun, 
but I think what I want to do right now is actually bury something in the garden and show you how it's done. Let's go. And now the big moment has arrived. We're going to bury the compost. To do that, you will need a couple of things. A rake to move the wood chips, a shovel to dig the hole, and also two containers. One with the fruit scraps from your freezer, and the other to harvest the finished compost that's already in the ground. One last item that I use is a placement stick. This tells me where I need to dig today. After today's hole, I will move the stick further down in the garden so I know where to dig next time. And this stick moves around clockwise around my yard. out the finished compost that's been sitting in the ground for about four months. And you can see how dark the soil is because of all the organic material. We've changed the angle a little bit here because I want you to appreciate the depth of the hole. That it's essential to dig a deep hole. It doesn't have to be wide but it does have to be deep. This marker here, this, the, the brand name there, that's two feet. That's as deep as I go. And the reason is when you bury your food scraps deeply, pests like rodents and raccoons and whatnot won't be able to smell it. We're gonna layer things with four layers. The food scraps go in at the very bottom because those are the ones that would emit the strongest odor. So you can see how deep it is. The full length of, of the shovel from tip to here has made it into there. Okay, so in go the food scraps. If they're still frozen, you can use a shovel to pummel them down a little bit like that. The food scraps have been added. Second layer is any yard trimmings you have. There's leaves, stems, spent flowers. And remember, you can always use a shovel to kind of stuff it into the hole. Layer number three is going to be the soil. So grab your trusty rake and pull the soil back over the hole to cap this material. The final layer is going to be wood chips. So I'm going to flip side here and come back with the wood chips. So I'll have a very pleasing, aesthetically attractive look by the time you're done. I have a word of caution for you. The hole that you're seeing here was made by some type of a rodent, a raccoon, a rat, or a mouse. And the reason they dug up this area of the garden is that they could smell the food buried beneath. This problem occurs when the food is not buried deep enough. I want to prevent this situation for you by reviewing the recommended size of the burial hole. The depth should be at least two feet. The width of the hole is not as crucial, and typically for me it's about one foot. The last comment I have is regarding the fertility of your garden and how trench composting will transform your soil. As you accumulate organic material, your soil will change. If we look in the depths down there, the sand, I have sandy soil, is lighter in color down there. Over here it's much darker. This is an improvement of the soil. Uh, if I take some of the sand excavated from deep below and I place it against the sand that's more on the surface, you can see the difference in color. This darker soil has much more organic matter in it than the soil that we just dug up. So those are some of the benefits of burying your compost. <laughs>